Uh, so first of all, for, for those who don't know me, I'm Graham Butler. I'm the director of the Global Economy and Finance Program in Chatham House. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is a uh, Wadston Club webinar discussion, uh, one of a series, and we're really delighted to welcome uh, uh, Yannick Lemarek, uh, who's the executive director of the Green Climate Fund, uh, who's going to be our speaker today. Yannick, thank you very much for joining us. I mean, I, I know this is a particularly busy time for you with COP27 coming up and have also been uh, in discussions here. So for you to take this time, it's really um, extremely, uh, extremely grateful for that. By way of context, um, I mean, we know that climate change is accelerating uh, and the physical effects um, are becoming more and more evident. It's impossible not to see that. And as the physical effects become more evident, uh, the risk of big policy shocks also increases, which is something we were, we were talking about earlier before coming up. Uh, and we also know that despite the uh, remarkable progress that's been made um, in certain technologies and the decarbonization in certain sectors, uh, we're not moving fast enough, not moving anywhere like fast enough, uh, um, including to meet the uh, 1.5 degrees. We have, what, eight, eight and a half years left of the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, which is, which is very little uh, time. Uh, and we also know that closing the gap uh, between uh, what is needed and what is actually happening is going to require an enormous amount of finance, uh, both public and private. I think it's very important to see that as finance, not cost, because it's a very different a very different thing. People tend to talk about this at cost, but actually this is finance, which um, is potentially going to be very productive for our economies in the future. But there's really, in that context, no better person to take us through the issues um, than Yannick. And the GCF is now um, the largest global fund dedicated to um, fighting climate change. Uh, Yannick became the executive director in 2019. And prior to that, he has a career spanning some 30 years in the UN system, focused on climate change, development, and finance. And just to highlight a number of the um, roles that he's held before, uh, he was the deputy executive director for UN Women. He was also the executive coordinator of the UN Multidonor Trust Fund Office, which I think probably gave you quite a bit of expertise in relation to, to what you're, you're dealing with now. I think there's some 100 trust funds uh, that come under that uh, role. And he was also UNDP executive coordinator uh, for the Global Environment Facility. Uh, Yannick is very kindly going to give us uh, an introductory presentation uh, for around 25 minutes. I will then put a few questions uh, before we open it up to the audience. Um, and just to emphasize, everything is on the record. Uh, and as I say, as well as those in the room, we have a, quite a, we have a big audience um, uh, online. And my job is to balance between the two. So I'll try and mix those questions together. We have a hard stop at 11 o'clock. Uh, so please do keep your questions and comments uh, as much to the point and as brief as possible, and we can get as many in. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank um, the Watson Club, which is sponsoring this, um, uh, this seminar, and uh, the funders of the club, which is uh, IKEA Foundation, KR Foundation, and the Rothschilds Foundation. So with that, Yannick, over to you. And magically, I think your slides will appear on the screen, but let's hope that works. Yes, very good. Many, many thanks, uh, Crayon. And uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, at the onset, I would like to deeply thank uh, Chatham House for uh, organizing uh, this uh, event. The, uh, so I will try to, uh, my presentation will very much focus on the why uh, the, when you discuss with institutional investors, they are telling you, uh, you know, we are committed to climate change, we are committed to EGs, but we cannot find any bankable project. And why, whenever do you discuss with some, uh, with a, with an investor, with an entrepreneur, you hear, you know, we have some great project, but we cannot access any kind of finance. And so, is one group lying, or is there something else between between the two? And the uh, so, if I go to the first slide, maybe just to to summarize where we stand in terms of uh, climate change. The, uh, according to the latest report from the UNFCCC Secretariat uh, under NDC uh, synthesis, 
we are now on track for uh, an increase in uh, average global temperature of 2.1 to 2.9 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So it should be good news because uh, 20 years ago, we were on track for an increase in average global temperature of three to four degrees Celsius. So we seems to have shaved off at least one degree Celsius over the past uh, 20 years. No, it's not that a good news. Uh, the first reason is because uh, the, uh, the temperature increase is happening far faster than what we thought. When the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, the likelihood that we will cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius, at least one in the next five years, was 0%. Today, the likelihood that we have to cross 1.5 degrees Celsius, at least one over the next five years, is 50%. 1.5 degrees Celsius, why is it important? It's because at the maximum temperature we have experienced since the beginning of the Neolithic uh, Revolution, during the Holocene, during the last 12,000 years. Our farming system have never gone, have never experienced a temperature above 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, compared to the pre-industrial uh, level. And so our farming system and our societies might experience something our civilization, our current civilization has never experienced. We could cross the two degrees Celsius threshold anywhere between 2040 to 2060. Over the past 2.5 million years, the Pleistocene that has seen the emergence of the species, the Homo sapiens, and all its antecessors, temperatures have oscillated between minus six during the ice age to plus two during an interglacial, minus six, plus two, minus six, plus two. We have never gone beyond plus two. And so by 2040, we might experience a temperature that's uh, no, no, not our species and none of its antecessors have ever experienced. So we are at the beginning of a gigantic experiment. In addition to, to, to this, uh, to this uh, faster than expected increase in global average temperature, the impact of uh, this temperature increase is likely to be much more severe than what we thought. For example, 20 years ago, we thought that it will take uh, an increase in global average temperature of about four to six degrees Celsius before we will see the collapse of uh, the entire ecosystem, such as, for example, uh, the coral reef ecosystem. Today, we believe that at least 90% of the coral reef ecosystem will collapse before we reach two degrees Celsius, uh, endangering the livelihood of close to 500 million uh, people. The, uh, when I was a student, things such as uh, uh, events such as a thermohaline disruption, uh, but what basically transferred the heat from the equators to the pole, was basically a, a science fiction uh, scenario. Only people who, who would live in their dorm and get out only at night with red eyes were concerned about it. So no, we know that the slowing down of the thermal in circulation is not something completely out of this world. It's something we should start monitoring. So that's the reason why there is a lot of literature nowadays on the physical tipping points where the entire system basculate. So that's the climate crisis. The, when we use the term, when the Secretary General did use the terminology of crisis, it was not an overstatement. What can we do about it? On paper, we should be able to do plenty of things about it. Next slide. Because there are also some very, very good news. The, over the past 10 years, the cost of uh, renewable energy technologies has dramatically dropped. For uh, solar, it has dropped by 90% uh, over the past uh, decade. And this is uh, uh, renewable uh, wind power, it's almost as much. And this is completely unprecedented. That's the first time that we have sources of energy whose price drops. The cost of oil today is more or less the cost that it was 140 years ago. The, uh, the cost of energy was not changing, was not dropping. Here, for the first time, we have uh, energy technology whose costs keep dropping at light speed. And uh, every, so it's about 10% a year, the, the drop in uh, the cost of energy. For example, uh, for solar, the cost of one watt was uh, 50 years ago, $1,000. Uh, it was 3.8 in 2008 and uh, 0.40 uh, cents in 2000, uh, 40 cents in 2018. 
and uh, as a result also the install capacity uh, increased dramatically we have uh, added uh, one uh, we have added uh, we have doubled uh, the uh, the uh, capacity uh, uh, by 1.2 1200 gigawatt uh, the uh, for renewable over the past 10 years and we should add 1.2 thousand 1200 gigawatt the same amount over the next five years so this is basically a geometric, a geometric growth and uh, if we were to continue experiencing this kind of uh, geometric growth within two decades we should have been able to completely decarbonize our energy system the uh, next slide so what will it means in terms of uh, uh, the cost of energy in terms of the energy transition it means that so uh, we could actually save 14 trillion dollars through going through a very fast energy transition here it's something which is also the opposite of what was the dominant economic wisdom the dominant economic wisdom until very recently was that so uh, we had better to wait because the next generation will be richer will have more technology and will be better able to address climate change actually when you look at these numbers at the opposite the, the sooner you act the faster you act the more money you save and i fully agree with you Korean. it's not a cost today it's an investment and delaying is basically forgetting investment opportunities this is the upside the opportunities now if we look at the cost of uh, inaction doing nothing next slide the i will give i will leave a copy of this uh, slides and they are not supposed to be user-friendly slides <laughs> the uh, it's uh, here it's basically a list uh, uh, of uh, all the assets that are uh, exposed to uh, climate uh, risk be physical risk or transition risk or uh, litigation uh, risk. And if I take only the first line of it, basically uh, the financial assets directly tied to uh, property. The, uh, by, 2000, uh, by the end of this century, by 2100, the cost of uh, assets uh, exposed to basically a dramatic increase in the in uh, in uh, extreme weather events, uh, uh, hurricane, uh, sea level rise, the uh, the value could be fourteen trillion dollars. So, if we accelerate uh, our energy transition, we can basically make fourteen trillion dollars of benefits. If we do not take action, only the first line here is fourteen trillion dollars of cost. So what should a responsible, smart uh, financier do? We have plenty of financiers here. <laughs> Normally, you run away from cost, you run, away, you run toward, uh, toward uh, opportunities. So rather than having $14 trillion of cost, I prefer to have $14 trillion of income. Yeah. So therefore, I sh we, should, we should be witnessing a dramatic shift in financial flows from the uh, 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 economy of today toward the net zero climate resilient uh, uh, investment. Next one. Well, the financiers have been doing a lot of running recently. <laughs> <laughs> we have a dramatic investment gap. The, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the, neither the opportunities nor the risk are currently uh, factored into uh, the price of assets and uh, into investment. And the total investment uh, last year, uh, in 2020 was 632 billion dollars compared to a need of anywhere between 1 trillion to 7 trillion, depending on the estimates. Uh, but most estimate turn around uh, four to six uh, trillion. So we have a huge uh, financial uh, gap. The financial system is not adjusting to the uh, climate crisis. And this is particularly concerning because we were living in the best possible time for climate investment. Next slide. Next slide. The, uh, in 2018, 2018, 2020, what we have seen, 2021, what we have seen is up to 16 trillion dollars of uh, assets yielding negative yield. And uh, why an asset in, a, in an infrastructure normally has a real return of uh, four to five percent. And so we couldn't move money when we had negative yield. No, we are unfortunately, most likely uh, to go toward the era of uh, high interest rates, sustained high uh, interest rate, 
And so what we could not do with these conditions will become even more difficult uh, in the future. So how can we explain this uh, climate finance uh, paradox? Next slide. Money basically follow a, a reward risk gradient. If, uh, if, uh, if an infrastructure in investment can give you a real return of four to five or six percent, but you have a very high risk of losing all your money, or you prefer to go for uh, a negative yielding asset, and uh, so actually it's a very rational, uh, rational choice to do nothing if you think that it's better to do nothing than to lose all, the, all your resources. And uh, let me take uh, and this, let me take an example. The, in, uh, in UK, uh, uh, during last summer, the, there was an auctioning of 11 gigawatts of uh, renewable uh, energy. 11 gigawatts of renewable energy is the equivalent of 11 nuclear plants. It's enough uh, for 14% of the electricity consumption of UK. And uh, it was the fourth auctioning based on a contract for difference, where basically uh, the government guarantee a minimum price and an access uh, to the grid. And so this is a strike price, the minimum price. And actually last summer, there was a striking strike price because for example, uh, the cost of offshore wind power as part of uh, this uh, auction was 37 pounds per uh, megawatt hour. It was one third of uh, the, the cost of nuclear, one ninth of the cost of gas at that time. The strike price was so low uh, that uh, with the strike price, the, the government give you money. If it's lower, you give back money if it's higher. Huh? Uh, the the price uh, the price uh, well, the strike price is so low that most likely the H acre will get back 1.5 billion uh, British pound from that deal, and so the uh, and uh, why the British government used to conduct this uh, auction every two years no it will conduct this auction every year it takes on average three to four years for this kind of renewable energy capacity to be commissioned so we could imagine that by 2030 95 percent of the British electricity will be decarbonized mostly for, uh, with uh, offshore uh, wind power and the shaker has to make plenty of money thanks to that the and uh, the British citizen will save a lot of money uh, so here it seems that we have a perfect win-win uh, solution. Why don't we do that in the rest of the world? Or at least all the countries that have good uh, wind uh, power. Today, UK is the best in class in terms of uh, cost for uh, offshore wind power. Say a French. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you can see how difficult it is. <laughs> the, uh, but now, imagine, let's imagine that we take exactly the same technology, this British-made uh, technology, and we bring it to an African country. The African country, on average, are B minus in terms of uh, rating. And there, uh, this project, which is so attractive in UK, uh, will, be, will not be backable in uh, most uh, African countries. The reason is that because for this project to be feasible in UK, you need first to have a lot of engineering skills and uh, uh, any kind of technical skills. And this might not be there, this might not be the case. You need uh, basically uh, the shipyard to be able to, uh, uh, to build your wind turbine and to upload it, might not be the case. Uh, your, you might have the shipyards, you might have the skill, but uh, fossil fuel might be subsidized at uh, 95%. So even at 37 British pounds per megawatt hour, you are still uh, not uh, competitive. The, uh, and uh, you might uh, basically uh, have to get the approval of 27 administration uh, to get your uh, sitting license. And, uh, and the, uh, that might take you four years. And once you have your wind turbine uh, up and running, uh, they might be basically boycotted by uh, the local uh, fishing community. And so, uh, and let's imagine that you have been able to get rid of all these different uh, problems, notably fishing community, by involving them as uh, stakeholders and shareholders. The uh, you because you are in a B minus country, you will simply not get access to money. 
Uh, the reason why in UK it was possible to have a strike price of uh, uh, 37 British pounds, it's because at that time it was less than 2% for uh, the, uh, the British uh, bond, the, uh, the T-bond, you add 2% for the private sector, so it must have been 4% the cost of capital. In a B-minus country, the cost of capital will be 18%, and the tunnel will be two years. Why you need at least a tunnel of 10 years in order for you to be able to, to, to finance a project. So this wonderful British experience uh, uh, is simply not uh, exportable. It's not, uh, and this project is uh, not bankable because there are plenty of barriers to green, uh, to climate uh, investment. And that's the reason why uh, you have a lot of in institutional investors, you have a lot of promoters who want to develop these projects, but they cannot access money because the bankers do not find them bankable. And so any invest, for example, any investor in a country in the 27 administration, not to happen, any investor in a B minus country is not to happen. The, uh, and that's uh, the key uh, reason behind the climate finance paradox. So what can we do about it? Next slide. <coughs> the, uh, we have to basically uh, completely uh, de-risk and uh, reprice uh, investment. The, uh, the, the situation in the, in the country where uh, the cost of money is 18%, in a sense, if you are an investor, you, the business as, you, as, you, as usual going the red line, going with a coal fire power plant, it's the one that makes much more sense because uh, we know the technology is not very risky. The risk of delays in commissioning are very low. The risk of cost overrun are extremely low. It's basically a plain vanilla investment as much as a <coughs> infrastructure investment can be plain vanilla. Now, if you go with a, a wind power a project, first, the uh, upfront capital expenditure are much, much, much higher. Normally, uh, the lower operation and maintenance costs, OPEX, in low financing cost environment should compensate. But because your uh, financing uh, costs are so high, the, uh, the lower OPEX will never compensate for the higher uh, CAPEX. And in addition, because you are speaking about a new technology, uh, therefore, uh, the, the risk of overrun because either of uh, technical problems or uh, uh, basically commissioning problems or regulatory problem is extremely high. And uh, the and you, you go to your banker, you need a lot of upfront capital, and you go back to your banker and you say, and I know I have a major cost, over, cost overrun, and uh, I will commission two years after, and I have no more liquidity. Your banker will love you forever. <laughs> and, uh, and that's today the situation today. We have to move. Uh, to a situation where uh, we can de-risk a project to the level where the cost of capital is uh, acceptable. Because the banker will look and say, okay, there is this risk, but that's the way they have been addressing this risk. There is this risk, but that's the way they have been addressing this risk. So rather than asking 18%, I will, I will satisfy myself with 8% or 6%. And therefore, uh, because your cost of capital is much, much lower, even if you have a higher capex, because your opex is much lower, actually your green light, your wind power, will have a, a much better uh, uh, net present value, much better in terms of rate of return uh, at the end. And uh, the, in addition, uh, you will certainly have to come with mechanisms to uh, reduce the risk of uh, uh, cost overrun. And I will come back to some of uh, this mechanism so that if you have a delay in commissioning, it's not uh, catastrophic. And for uh, the coal fire power plant, it's important uh, for the investors uh, not to look at it as a plain vanilla project anymore, but a project where they might have to prematurely retire their assets, a project uh, if it's a, a power generation asset. Uh, a project, if it's a, a road, an infrastructure, where they might have a dramatic increase in uh, OPEX because they will have to reduce the roads every two years mm -hmm. or because the uh, coastal infrastructure will be completely washed away. And therefore, the real risk of bankruptcy, of illiquidity, and after leading to solvency issues is no more with the green project, it's with the red project. And so we have to shift from 
the, the first situation to the second situation. Next slide. The, uh, here again, this is my user-friendly slide. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there is a worse one coming. It's, uh, it's a kind of summary of uh, all the uh, environmental policy instruments that have been developed in order to de-risk climate investment. There are more than 4,000 according to the Interna International Energy uh, Agency. But basically, you can link, you can, uh, you can uh, sort them in five main uh, type of uh, projects, the information instruments, the regulation, the uh, market-based and economic instruments, the institutional instrument, you create a new institution, a green bank, and the financial instrument that will deal with project. And so the first type, first, uh, the first uh, four type of, of uh, instruments will basically work both on the, the supply side and the demand side of a market in order to transform a market or, and to create a new green market. The fifth category of instruments are the instruments that you will use in order to de-risk one specific investment. And this specific investment will basically establish a commercial uh, track record. The, uh, and establishing a commercial track record is extraordinarily important because bankers cannot deal with uncertainty, they can deal with risk. Once you have a commercial track record, you can estimate risk. You are no more dealing with uh, uncertainty. And so the, the, what we know uh, for uh, sure is that sorry, none of this instrument will work in isolation. There is, there is among economists, uh, there has been among economists a kind of uh, quest of the ground of the holy ground for uh, the past 50 years, the instrument that will take care of uh, everything. Uh, so be carbon price, be climate risk disclosure, be green taxonomy, or be prudential ratio. Uh, among the engineers, uh, basically at the moment in time, we wanted to only do failing tariff throughout the world. The, there is not a single instrument that can work in isolation because you have uh, such a plethora of risk that you will have to use different type of instrument. And a policy instrument takes place within a political economy. And therefore, some policy instruments will be completely inefficient here, while they will be extremely effective there. So uh, the, the key task today of policymakers is to come with an optimal mix of policy instruments in order to de-risk uh, investment in a given sector, in a given set of uh, uh, technologies. Uh, next one. And so, uh, here we have uh, UK, the best in class for uh, offshore uh, wind power. Uh, a country X, uh, uh, B minus, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, basically is experiencing a number of risks. Every time you have a risk, you have a premium on that risk and another premium and another premium. And to the moment, the risk is not bankable. And to make the, pro the project is not bankable. Mm -hmm. And to make the project bankable, you will be using this instrument, for example, you will streamline the approval process for a wind power project. Uh, you can say, as long as you sit your uh, wind farm in uh, this geography, you need no uh, authorization. The, uh, because you will have used the geographic information system overlaying every single concerns you have. Uh, you, you can speak also about uh, phasing out uh, subsidies, coming with uh, de-risking instruments such as a contract for difference, etc. And so you use a number of uh, different instruments until the moment where uh, the risk reward profile make it bankable. You might not be at the same level of uh, uh, financing than the best in class, but you will, speak, you will still be somewhere where it's possible. It's possible. Uh, next one. So what is the role of uh, GCF? By now you must have figured it out what is our role. <laughs> When we want to be very, very jargon, uh, jargonic, we, uh, we basically say our job is to reprice uh, asset classes and create new asset classes. The, I was looking around the table, this, this audience should be clear about what this means. But in a sense, uh, we are, our job is to accelerate climate uh, innovation and uh, investment. And we have adopted a three-pronged approach where first we create an enabling environment, notably through transformative uh, planning. And after, we support uh, climate innovators to come up with new climate solution. And after, once a new, we raise a new climate solution, we de-risk the first application at commercial scale of this new climate solution in order to establish a track record. 
and after we work with uh, the domestic financial system, we green the domestic financial system to uh, support a widespread uh, adoption of uh, of. Uh, the, this uh, new climate solution. So I will give one example for each of one, transformation, transformational planning. The next slide is will cost uh, it, it is will is will cost a fortune uh, uh, to be able to protect uh, every single infrastructure. Infrastructure has, are part of uh, networks, and so what we are trying to do is that we are trying to provide to, to promote integrated planning with grant finance, where we enable uh, countries to uh, overlay their uh, water network, electricity network, uh, uh, transport uh, network, telecommunication networks, and we with uh, the maps of. Uh, uh, climate hazards and uh, after to identify which nodes cannot be offline for more than uh, two weeks and have to be uh, protected. This uh, and uh, after what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, optimal mix of gray and uh, green uh, solution are, uh, are the best. Often, for example, a green solution will be more effective than a, a gray uh, solution. And after, uh, what kind of uh, policy instruments will be uh, useful to deal with some type of project? What kind of policy and financial instrument will be required? And what kind of investment has to be financed from public money? And should it be financed from a carbon tax or a wealth tax, basically? The, uh, the reason why you, we have to take a systemic approach the, uh, is because any first is will cost a fortune to strengthen every single infrastructure. Second, uh, the, you will not strengthen it. And for example, there is uh, the example of the bridge uh, in uh, of the over the, the river, the river Choluteca in uh, Honduras. The Honduras is uh, is extremely vulnerable to uh, hurricane. The government government knew perfectly that it was uh, vulnerable to hurricane, so decided to commission. Uh, the a bridge that could withstand any kind of a hurricane. When Hurricane Mitch did it uh, in October uh, uh, 1998, almost all the bridges in the country were destroyed, but the uh, Choluteca Bridge. The only problem is that one. The course of the river did change, and so you have no bridge to uh, nowhere. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and, uh, in the uh, and I, I, my, my colleague tells me that I've run out of time, so I move to the uh, other uh, slide. So that is basically the reason why we have to go for transformative uh, planning. After catalyzing innovation, we desperately need to catalyze innovation. The most of the solution for the global south will have to be developed in the global south because they do not make sense in the global north. And uh, this uh, is as much a financial solution as a business model as a technological uh, solution. And uh, unfortunately, for uh, for entrepreneurs, uh, for climate entrepreneurs in the global south, they cannot get access to any kind of uh, incubator and accelerator services. There are only 25 in the global south, and even if we get some access, uh, we cannot ex get access to early growth finance to to come with the first uh, proof of concept of uh, the new climate solution. And so GCF uh, supports the development of uh, incubators and accelerators, and we developed uh, early. Uh, growth financing uh, mechanism. And for example, uh, because we are capital agnostic, we are financing grant, but we can use any kind of uh, grant and non-grant instrument. We can provide concessional debt, we can provide equity, we can provide insurances, we can provide guarantee. For that one, we uh, we, we supported the establishment of a $400 million private equity fund to invest in innovative adaptation technologies. To reassure investors, we provided $100 million of first lost uh, equity. equity. So that is to support uh, a novel solution. Once we have the novel solution, as I mentioned, we have to de-risk it. Next uh, slide. And the de-risking can be relatively uh, simple or can be relatively complex. And uh, here, for example, Climate Investor One was a private equity fund that we did uh, support uh, in uh, 2018. And uh, we ended up providing a grant for project development. So, uh, so in case of... Uh, cost uh, to reduce the risk of cost overrun and uh, delay in terms of commissioning. In some uh, jurisdiction, up to 90% of the project will not reach a commissioning stage. Mm -hmm. And so there we provide grant. Mm -hmm. Now, if the project reach commissioning stage, we convert our grant into equity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah. we hope that we get enough equity to be able to replenish our uh, grant component. And in terms of equity, we normally take uh, the junior uh, equity trench. 
And after all, the, this project is reaching the stage where we hope to have soon enough assets so that we can make it an EBS and uh, offload it to a capital market and create a virtuous cycle we can have a, a, a sustainable source of financing. So this is one mechanism of de-risking. We have 200, uh, more than 200 projects, 209 projects. If you are interested, I would suggest that you go to our website where you will have a library of different de-risking mechanisms. Uh, we have used hundreds of different uh, instruments. A last uh, slide on our four-pronged approach, the idea of uh, greening finance. So we will be working with a domestic financial institution to help them in uh, 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 understanding of the uh, uh, green taxonomy or creating their own green taxonomy, uh, disclosing climate-related uh, risk, which is critical for them to be able to access market, and maybe access market for providing a, a guarantee to any kind of green bonds. There are 250 national development banks in the world, and only 58 can access uh, market. With the British government, we have just established a green guarantee company that will provide a 100% guarantee to uh, infrastructure project in developing countries. Because we provide 100% guarantee, it's not the sovereign credit rating that is taken into account when we issue a bond, it's the credit rating of uh, this company that should be normally triple B plus. And I will, uh, on my last slide, uh, maybe very quickly, the, uh, by no, uh, <coughs> GCF is a fairly risky venture. Uh, government invests in crime in us, which is certainly a good idea. <laughs> the, uh, it, we don't have a credit rating. We don't want to have a credit rating. The, uh, but we are basically uh, a public social impact investors. We do not work. We are uh, we. Uh, we don't, our level of risk uh, is we are a, a patient risk capital uh, provider. And uh, within the um, overall landscape, uh, that's our positioning. The, we put ourselves in the middle, not because we were firm centric, but also because we do not develop our own projects. We are uh, a co investors. We work with more than 200 partners uh, from some of the largest commercial banks in the world to uh, civil society organizations. And uh, what we do is that we try to serve as a hub of the uh, climate finance architecture, helping each of our partners to, to basically meet their hurdle rate because we, uh, we de-risk uh, them. But when your business model is at such a level of risk, it's important to have an impeccable uh, due diligence process. And my last slide is that uh, the, uh, we basically have a double uh, uh, due diligence process. We have the due diligence of all our partners who have to undergo a fairly uh, demanding accreditation process before we can uh, manage our resources. And the Secretariat has its own second level uh, due diligence and uh, with uh, the three lines of defense of uh, Costco. So I have people who basically do job in terms of co-investment is to reduce uh, the project uh, technical soundness risk. I have people in the second line of defense who are looking at uh, legal risk and uh, uh, environmental and social safeguard risk. And we have independent units uh, for uh, uh, integrity risk, for uh, redress uh, risk, etc., etc. So it's a fairly complex uh, architecture, which makes us uh, an extremely efficient uh, organization for projects of $250 million. But if you want five hundred thousand dollars from us, it will take us. Well, Danny, thank you very much. I mean, that's absolutely brilliant. It's, uh, it's well, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> we'll come back and have at the end as well. But anyway, um, so it's super clear, and so much of what you said rings really, really true to, to things that we've been um, thinking about. Um, what I would first like to do, and actually I can see we're already getting a lot of questions online, but just encourage everybody who's online to put their questions in the Q&A function, and then Anna's helping me pick these up now. But I would, while those questions are coming in, and also people are thinking here, I'd just like to, to pick up on one point, which is you very clearly describing in describing the de-risking you separated the things you can do on the supply side from what you ultimately then have to do and take the residual risk and in circumstances where we have very little time you know what could you say in a rough sense what you think the balance is going to be between the sort of de-risking act of the, the on the supply side de-risking and in a sense the what the world as a whole through public finance is going to have to do in terms of taking um, you know, the ultimate risk 
uh, because the, the finance markets would like us to do all the latter. You know, just take all the risk and we'll provide the finance and we'll get the upside. Um, obviously, we can't do that. I mean, we just isn't enough money. But how do you see those two um, balancing? And then a related question is there are a lot of other new vehicles in, in place, you know, the IMF's Resilience Sustainability Trusts. You've got um, the Capital Advocacy Review of the MDBs, which will probably come to fruition next year. So there are all these other potential players in this space. How do you see them interacting with what you're doing here? Thank you. Uh, the same way that you cannot strengthen the resilience of one infrastructure at a time, you cannot de-risk uh, every single supply. Mm. The amount of money will be bank-boggling. Uh, we often have a concessionality in grant uh, equivalent of uh, 25%, 30%. When we work with private equity fund, is very low, concessionality 5%, 10%. But uh, when we work... Uh, in uh, low-income countries on uh, adaptation in rural areas, our concessionality might be 80%. So we will never have the money to be able to uh, to only work on the supply. So we right. have to work uh, on the demand. It's true that uh, some uh, demand side uh, uh, solution will require a lot of time, the, uh, but some do not. For example, streamlining uh, a licensing process uh, will not require as much as much time as uh, developing uh, the uh, technical skills that you need. And so the, you have to do everything in parallel. You do with uh, some uh, strategic uh, project on the supply side because we will create your track record. You try to go for the low hanging fruit on the demand side. And while you work on the on the some uh, longer term uh, uh, initiative, what we know for sure is that you do not have to wait for perfection. Uh, you can come with a, a set of instruments that enable you to create a market in a political economy in a, that is not perfect. And so uh, their uh, perfection is truly the enemy of the good. The, uh, we know that we can create a market in less than 10 years. I mean, so, for example, in the UK, we could transform the energy, uh, the energy mix in 10 years. We can create a market in 10 years, even in jurisdictions that are plagued by uh, other, uh, other problems. And the role of how you connect with the, the RST and the World Bank and these other kind of, I mean, the MDBs when they have been But the, uh, among our uh, accredited entities, right. we have all the MDBs. Basically, yeah. we work with, the com with commercial banks, we work with national development banks, we work with multilateral development banks, with UN agencies, etc. Right. And uh, the, uh, for the, uh, with, uh, with the banks, we tend to focus on the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, we have right now uh, uh, one project with the bank, which is uh, uh, 1.4 billion dollars, 300 billion dollars from us, and 1.1 in, uh, in, in guarantees, and 1.1 in loans from the bank to uh, strengthen the grid in several African countries and uh, to provide guarantees to independent power producers. This will, be, will mobilize about $5 billion in private money, and we are providing the guarantee. And so that's it's a typical project that we will have uh, with the bank, uh, working on the comparative advantages. So depending on the institution, we will go for one type of project or another type of project. And the institution comes all with a different type of project, yes. even if I don't see the logo. Yeah. After uh, having read simply the summary, I can tell you from where it's come from. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so let's take some questions in the room first. Uh, and if you could just say who you are before you ask the uh, question, Richard, that would be great. Richard Oblath from the H2 Transition Capital uh, Fund. Um, th th this is very interesting, the whole de-risking issue. But there's an example of de-risking that started at COP26, and from what I understand is really struggling, and that was de-risking uh, the change from coal uh, production and coal power stations in South Africa. Um, I don't know if you've looked at that situation, but uh, some governments put up eight and a half billion dollars, and yet that program is stalled because it didn't take into account the human resistance from the people who work in the coal mines and the power stations and all the associated businesses. How do you deal with that in, in, in the work you're doing? The, um, 
actually, it's did him to take into account uh, the dislocation for the coal mining uh, capacity, the communities, and the reason why it was called uh, just energy uh, transition. The, uh, the transition will be just or will not happen. The uh, any kind of uh, the uh, any kind of uh, uh, climate policy that does not take into account the income uh, differentiated impact, the gender differentiated impact, the group differentiated impact, and the group differentiated impact is bound uh, to fail. For example, if you take the uh, yellow vest uh, riot uh, in France, uh, the idea was to come with a carbon tax. Uh, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emission. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for people living in rural areas, they had no alternative uh, means of transport. Uh, their income is much, much lower than people in uh, urban areas who have plenty of alternative uh, uh, public transport uh, opportunities. And uh, the result was uh, uh, a sentiment of uh, total injustice, and it was completely blocked. So. Uh, the, uh, when, uh, for us, one of the key tests when we get a project is what will be the differentiated impact of this project and how can we build uh, equity into climate uh, policy. There is a lot of literature on the just energy transition, but I'm concerned about, uh, for example, agricultural transition. I'm concerned that the uh, risk of dislocation will be even bigger by an order of magnitude when we will have to shift of our, uh, our food system. So on our side, the, how we deal with it is when uh, the, uh, to try to see how to uh, maximize the co-development benefits is one of our investment criteria. And we have an environmental and social segment team that basically focus on that one. What will be the impact on uh, women versus impact on, on men? What will be the impact on the poor versus impact on the rich? Uh, interesting piece of trivia, uh, the, uh, the top 1% emit 17% of uh, the world uh, uh, GHG emission, the bottom 50% emit only 12%. And uh, the number of policies that I've seen in my career targeting the bottom 50 and not the top 1% is mind boggling. Thanks very much. Uh, let's take a quick Anthony question. We'll go online and then we'll come back. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, Anthony from, from Chatham House. Thank you so much. It was a really great presentation. Um, I had a point and then maybe a question, if that's okay, or maybe they're both questions, is um, the graph you talk about sort of old technologies and new technologies. And when do you think renewables become part of the new narrative in, in, in terms of the majority of new power around the world is now renewable in terms of installation? So, it's obviously a learning curve, and you talked about the problems in many developing countries in terms of actually getting things installed. But yeah, when is that switch going to happen? And then the second point is, in terms of the current situation, the war in Ukraine, etc. There's some clear wins in terms of for the energy transition. Renewables are now even more cheaper than fossil fuels, but some clear losses in terms of interest rates, lack of government capital availability, et cetera. So how do we play that out over the next couple of years? How does that affect many of the things that you're talking about? First, in terms of how long this transition is to take, the, the two slides were borrowed from, a, from an outstanding paper from Professor Wade from the, uh, from the Oxford University. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to, to have a look at it. Is, uh, he believes that uh, the transition will take place within the next uh, two decades. So that means basically the carbon decarbonization in countries such as UK will have taken place by 2040. Uh, in UK, there is a clear path for even intercarbonization by 2032-33. The, uh, uh, the, uh, you have a number of uh, authors that are even more, uh, more uh, optimist when they say that this could happen by 2035. Some say that this will not happen by 2050 and we need nature-based solution. I would say ultimately uh, there is a huge uh, literature. I'm not aware any, you know, about anybody thinking that this will take more than beyond 2050. So it's between I would say 15 to 30 years. You pick up, uh, you pick up your time before we are 100% uh, renewable. And hydrogen, green hydrogen, normally will play a key role in terms of storage and how to decarbonize uh, uh, sector. Now, uh, the uh, uh, the war in Ukraine is very interesting because uh, de facto uh, we are seeing a gigantic carbon tax. And, uh, and we are seeing also the effect of a gigantic carbon tax, 
without accompanying uh, measures. And the, uh, when one could expect uh, that uh, uh, because of this uh, gigantic carbon tax, we will see a dramatic acceleration of investment in renewable energy, and the International Energy Agency uh, predicts so. But at the same time, we can see a dramatic increase in interest rate. We can see a dramatic increase in debt to GDP uh, ratio. We can see uh, a dramatic impoverishment of uh, people, which is not good for investment. So uh, the, uh, you can come with a scenario where, thanks to, uh, to, to uh, this dramatic uh, carbon tax, we will do it five, five years earlier, or because of this dramatic carbon tax, it will take five years more. Uh, the, for me, it will very much depend on, on the response of uh, policymakers, what kind of measures they put in place. It's possible that we will save five years, but not without uh, uh, policy measures. And one will have to pay attention to developing countries. It's not only policy measures in OECD countries, it's also policy measures in developing uh, countries. Thanks. Uh, I've got some questions online I'd like to, to come to next. Uh, firstly, from uh, uh, Stefan Schwager. So, um, question a little bit you got into, which is, if we don't have a carbon tax and we don't have mandatory capital adequacy requirements on climate finance, you know, what's, what's going to make things move? Um, you know, is the private sector going to work it out for itself that it needs to do something quickly? Or do we need those, you know, those push elements in order to move things along? But the carbon tax uh, can help, but it will not be sufficient and it's not obligatory. So it's neither sufficient nor mandatory, but it's definitely a fool. So I think I would definitely not recommend the carbon tax. But if you do not have, but this carbon tax will have, is not a carbon tax because you have a traumatic uh, runaway price in Gaza. It will have a carbon tax where you look at the redistribution effect, etc. But even if you do not have a carbon tax, because the economics of renewable energy technologies today are so uh, positive, so attractive, that if you have the right industrial policies in place, you can make it happen. Okay. And then another couple of questions that relate to the link between climate action and biodiversity uh, from Toby Aykroyd and Dean Cooper. I mean, uh, Toby kind of points to the very controversial issue around um, use of wood for renewable energy in, in Europe and the, the consequences of that. But, uh, you know, what, what is your approach to making sure that there aren't serious biodiversity consequences of many of the things that are proposed for climate action at the moment in terms of your the projects that you're looking at or the broader picture the uh, gcf is uh, is a very strong proponent of uh, ecosystem based approaches the uh, and we believe that's basically the climate change crisis the biodiversity crisis the inequality crisis are simply different phases facets of the same uh, crisis. And uh, the, uh, when you uh, reduce uh, uh, emission from deforestation and forest degradation, the, it's not only a mitigation, uh, a, a climate mitigation activity, it's also a climate adaptation activity because you reduce the likelihood of uh, droughts and floods, and it's also a biodiversity uh, activity because you preserve uh, habitat. And we have come to, using the OECD markers, we have come to the conclusion that about 27% of uh, our resources uh, have a positive impact uh, on the biodiversity. But here again, there is no magical uh, tool, there is no magical uh, approach, there is no magical design. Every time you have to look at the project and see uh, how you can maximize biodiversity benefits and minimize biodiversity benefits. We are, we are not involved in biomass. No. Excellent. Uh, question here, uh, and then I'm going to group questions together, actually, because we're very short of time. So question from here, question from the lady here, and then we'll come back in a second, but let's take these two next. Please. Thank you. Uh, I represent the Swedish uh, Development Agency, uh, but uh, mainly working in Eastern Europe. Um, um, but my question, I think, is related more to my previous uh, academic background. I think I think your uh, presentation today really uh, recapped what I did about capital asset management model on the risk of investments in uh, renewables in developing countries. So that re very much resonated. And I want to address the issue of also, you mentioned about climate uh, finance paradox, uh, something similar is also about climate investment trap where the countries uh, which need this energy transition the most, they have the highest cost uh, to bear uh, of financing. Uh, and I particularly want to address renewables 
uh, what do you think could be feasible short-term um, measures or instruments to actually address the issue of extremely high financing costs in those countries? Uh, and this paradox also think related to countries which have the abundant uh, natural resources like solar in Africa. They have the, actually the, the most expensive uh, project costs. And uh, Perhaps, just because yeah. we, we know, want to try and get as many questions in as possible, so very, uh, was, it, was it the same, same area or another very quick question? A uh, very quick question yeah. uh, on, on the operation of fund. Um, it largely works with uh, uh, non-NEX uh, countries, and, uh, um, uh, which are largely developing countries. And uh, former industrialized countries in Europe, they had special uh, arrangement under the Kyoto Protocol, uh, but they don't actually have access being developing countries, and I mean East European countries, uh, some of them are part of the European Union and they have access to the EU funds, but some are left behind. What do you think could be, how you could basically would address to have this like small island between the two? Okay, and the lady at the table might give you a question. Yeah, and just say you're here. Let me ask you about improvement analytics. We look at governance and sustainability. And thank you for the presentation. I uh, just wanted to take us down from the supranational level right down to where we're looking at those who are managing the projects. How do you, what do you expect in terms of governance? Because you need governance for effective decision making and for a result driven and from risk based approach. Risk based approach is based on good governance. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were because you want finance and finance means governance at some point? How do you bring them together? Thanks. Would you like to? Yeah. These both questions are a bit linked to what we were yeah. uh, discussing yeah. before. Yeah. In terms of how to promote uh, uh, renewable energy, how to promote uh, investment in adaptation in, uh, in, uh, in developing countries, the uh, uh, one, uh, one option, one key option is first to, uh, to establish a commercial track record. So maybe the first thing to deal with your first project because without the first project nothing will happen there is uh, the the risk premium on developing countries is unbelievably high if you look at the body tables uh, in terms of uh, credit default the credit default rate in africa is lower than in the united states but the uh, risk premium is uh, gigantic so often we have to recalibrate the risk perception and the best way to recalibrate the risk perception is through getting a project off the ground. Also getting the project a project off the ground is often the best way to really understand what are the barriers. Because you can have as many academics as you want doing a study on barriers. It's only when you start trying to commission your projects that you will see the actual uh, risk. And so it's really important to get the first project uh, off the ground. And for that, we need international assistance. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a tragedy that we have not yet reached 100 billion dollars uh, uh, under the UNFCCC because this money is critical to establish uh, this uh, track uh, record. The, uh, and uh, it, the GCF is only 3% of the finance under the UNFCCC and there are 60 different funds. So normally, depending on your geography, uh, you should try to look at what kind of funds uh, operate. The, and you might indeed have a couple of uh, countries that are not taken, uh, taken care of. Go to a climate finance tracker and you can find the instruments. Governance here again would be wonderful to, have, to live in a perfect world with a perfect governance. We can actually uh, uh, de-risk climate investment uh, even in a governance that's uh, still a work in progress. And uh, the actually action is a way to accelerate governance uh, uh, improvement. It's, it's not in view of governance improvement. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. So um, I think there's one final question in the room. If you uh, yes, like to, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Yasumi Nikano, a visiting fellow from Japan. Uh, well, so being based in Asia, or South Korea more specifically, how would you find the development of renewable projects or the general sentiment in Asian countries? Uh, well, COP27 is coming soon, but and you are, you are meeting so many figures from Asia. But do you have any specific comment or feeling about uh, Korea or Japan or China and other Southeast Asian countries? If I, if I could just add to that, because I just came back from Japan yesterday, and there is this very sharp contrast between 
discussion in, in Japan, which is about transition finance. So they're looking for finance for transition. And they, they look at Europe and they say, Europe is going very hard, very direct. They want to do it all immediately. And you know the, the critique is that somehow that may be a bit realistic. So yes, yes if you forgive me for adding that to your point. Well, it's, um, Asia is very well placed to benefit from uh, this uh, green industrial revolution. It's uh, uh, an electric car, it's basically uh, a battery and a computer and four wheels. And uh, <laughs> most of the technologies right now is in Northeast uh, Asia. Asia has been able to achieve in terms of energy efficiency things that we thought were, uh, were impossible. For example, after the Fukushima incident, the uh, uh, Japan was in a situation on paper which was more dire than the situation of Europe today. And uh, uh, in a matter of three or four months, uh, did register unbelievable energy efficiency uh, gain. Uh, notably through getting rid of ties. Uh, <laughs> I had a, a meeting with a Japanese minister and without a tie, with, without a jacket, with a shirt, and we were sweating, but at the end we had a very good meeting. <laughs> the, uh, and so uh, increasingly, Asia doesn't, seen, doesn't see uh, the shift toward the net zero low emission uh, economy as a threat but maybe as its ticket to, to uh, economic prosperity. And that's the reason why we have seen the uh, Japan, Korea, China taking net zero uh, emission uh, commitment. It's, uh, we are also seeing uh, the same countries uh, uh, adopting a ban on the financing of coal fire, uh, coal fire power plant. Uh, so I, I'm relatively optimistic about uh, the uh, leading roles that Northeast Asia could play in the coming years. Great. Well, Yannick, thank you very much for a brilliant presentation and uh, for answering your questions. Thank you also to our audience uh, for coming and for being online and also for posing your questions. So thank you very much.